number four. We'll start there. Colossians chapter number four. <clears throat> Colossians chapter number four. Heard this quote this week. It wasn't at missions conference. It was the way home for missions conference. Listen to preaching in the car. I already said this in Sunday school. You all probably heard this and those of you that were in my class, but it really helped me, so I'm going to say it again. So you can just, you can just listen a second time. Maybe you didn't get it the first time. It was Brother Lee Cadenhead preaching, listening to some preaching by him, and he said this, or, or something close to this, best I can remember, he said, the Bible, we often look at the Bible as a book to be taught, and it is not necessarily a book to be taught, it is first a book to be believed, then it is a book to be obeyed, and then it is a book to be taught. That really helped me, because I don't know about you, sometimes I'm guilty of looking at this Bible as just, especially when you're, when you're tasked with teaching it, fairly regularly, you look at it as, as almost like a textbook. How can, I, how can I get a lesson out of these verses to teach other people? And that's not why the scripture exists. This Bible is here so you can believe it. And so that you can learn truth and obey the truth that you learn. It's not just here so you can, you can teach other people. Oh, that is what you're supposed to do with it once you've believed it, once you've obeyed it, once you've learned it. The Bible says you're supposed to commit this word to other people so that they can teach other people as well. But if the entire point of the Bible is just so you can teach other people, what, what's the point? This book is here for you to grow as a Christian. That helped me. It was a blessing to me. Hopefully it was blessing to you as well. All right, let's go ahead and read these verses here, and then we'll pray, ask God to bless our time, and learn a few lessons from Colossians chapter 4. Let's start in verse number 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. We'll be looking at verses 3 and 4 tonight, Lord will. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, we sure are thankful for this evening. Lord, thank you for allowing us to go to church. All around the world, there's Christians who can't do what we're, what we're doing right now, and we're truly thankful for this opportunity. Lord, so thankful for this church and this group of people. Thank you for people that love you and desire to be closer to you and desire to hear your word taught. Lord, you help me to do just that this evening. We, I'm, I am nothing. I am not able. I am not... Man in his best state is altogether vanity, and that's surely uh, our state this, this evening, Lord. But would you please help me to convey some sort of truth that would be helpful? Would you help us to try to listen and pay attention and grow in your word, Lord? After everything's done and said... Uh, tonight, Lord, our only desire is that you'd get honor, and that you'd get glory, and we'd get closer to you and be better Christians by what's done here tonight. Please, please help us. We sure do need your help. Thank you for dying for us, giving us everlasting life. We love you, and thank you for everything you do for us every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's read these verses again, just verse 3 and 4 here. The Bible says, With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. we got six lessons from these verses. We'll get through as many as we can tonight. Hopefully all six. That's our goal. We'll see what happens. Number one, the first thing I'd like you to notice from these verses is the spirituality of Paul's prayer request. The fact that Paul, when he was asking prayer of the Colossians, his main prayer, his main request, was for some sort of spiritual help for himself. In verse number 3, Paul has a prayer request. You're familiar with prayer requests. We take them quite regularly around here. For Wednesday night service, we ask, does anybody have a prayer request? Does anybody have anything that they would like the entire church to know about so they can help them pray about it? That's what Paul's doing in this verse. And although Paul, in this verse, look, look what he says in the end of verse number 3, for which I am also in bonds. If you remember back at the beginning, we talked about the fact that Paul is writing this epistle to the church of the Colossians from prison. He is currently locked up in some sort of bonds, not able to have freedom, not able to do what he wants, not able to go where he wants because of his witness for Jesus Christ. Paul is in bonds. And although Paul is locked up in a prison, his prayer request is not that the prison door would be opened. His main prayer request is that God would open a door, not the door of the prison, that God would open a door of utterance. His main prayer request is God would give him an opportunity to speak about Christ to someone. And when an opportunity arose, that he would speak as he ought to speak. 
What concerned Paul most about his current situation is not the fact that he was locked up. It was the fact that the gospel was locked up with him. What concerned Paul about his bonds was not that he lacked freedom. It's that he did not have the freedom to speak the gospel as he used to have. He was not able to tell as many people about Jesus Christ. Would to God we had that kind of care about lost people. Would to God that was our prayer request. If you are in prison tonight, what would you care most about? Getting out to see your family? That'd be legitimate. We're not trying to knock that. What would you care about? We're getting into, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. But I just want to generalize on this first point and just say Paul's main request was for something spiritual, not necessarily for something physical. Now, I am not going to suggest, you did not hear me say that it is wrong to pray for physical needs. There are many people in this room with legitimate physical needs, okay? There are many people that aren't here, and they aren't here because of their legitimate physical needs, and the Bible tells you to pray about that for yourself, and the Bible tells you to pray about that for other people. So not for one second am I saying that you ought not pray for your physical needs. Look, if I'm sick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for myself that I get better, and I'm going to ask you to pray for me that I get better. If I lose my job, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for you to pray for me. If you lose your job, I pray for you. I'm going to pray for myself. Look, those things are, are legitimate prayer requests. But because we are carnal, fleshly people, it is easy for us to become so engrossed with the physical that we completely lose sight of the spiritual. I'm not telling you don't pray for your physical needs, but don't forget what is even more important than the physical. Don't forget, while you're so concerned with your carnal needs, don't forget that your spiritual needs are of far more importance. We tend to spend a lot more time praying for health. We, spend to, we tend to spend a lot more time praying for, for, for health and wealth and favor in the physical realm, and that's okay. Sometimes, we, sometimes when we preach this, we go into the other ditch and say, we got to quit praying for all this physical stuff. Why don't more people pray for spiritual things in our prayer time? But both are legitimate. We're not trying to delegitimize your, your physical needs. They're absolutely legitimate. But we have a tendency, because we are in the flesh, to be completely blinded by the physical to the point where we never take time to even consider the spiritual. And Paul, in, in, in a, a worse physical state than you or I have probably been in, at least a long, long time, Paul is not praying that he'll get out of prison. Paul is praying that the gospel would go forth. It's not that Paul didn't pray about the fact that he was in jail. I'm sure he did quite often. In fact, there's scriptures where he prays uh, for, for his release. I'm sure Paul prayed for his health and safety and freedom. But the best way to say it is that he had his priorities straight. Paul recognized that the most important thing was the gospel. Paul recognized the most important thing were his spiritual prayer request and his spiritual well-being. I'm sure if you asked him, was your physical uh, prayer requests important, he'd say, sure, they're important, but they're not anywhere near as important as our spiritual prayer requests. Again, we aren't trying to say your, your physical or carnal problems are unimportant. If you're sick or have some, some sort of trouble, that's important to me. I don't want to just dismiss that. That, that. that is important to me. It's important to you. And I hope that whatever sickness or pain or trouble I face is important is you, to you. It'll be important to me. But we need to recognize that while those things are important, our spiritual needs are far more important. One of the greatest hindrances to Christianity as a whole has been putting the physical above the spiritual. You see it all over the place in Christians' personal lives. You see it all over the place in churches. They put a higher emphasis on their physical life than their spiritual life. That's a good way to kill a church. That's a good way to kill a Christian spiritually. Let's not make that mistake in our prayer life. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is your spiritual well-being. Okay? So again, pray for healing. Pray for help. Pray for those physical needs, but don't be so blinded by those seemingly huge things that you lose sight of the even bigger picture, which is your spiritual life. In the physical realm, if you were to identify an issue, some sort of physical issue, you'd do your best to identify what that was and pray about it. We should be doing the same thing spiritually, shouldn't we? I think we could all, I mean, every one of us would say, oh, I'm not perfect, I need a lot of help, I need a lot of work. I'm sure we could all look into our life and identify something in our life that needs work, that needs help spiritually. 
and we need to be praying for those things just like if we found out we had cancer. Just like if we found out we had some sort of... T just like if you found out you had the virus, you'd start praying for that. You, you identified an issue in your life and your physical body, and so you begin praying for it so the Lord will fix it. Why don't we do that spiritually? Why is it such a rare occasion that somebody stands up at a prayer meeting and says, Hey, I'm a terrible witness and I want to do better. And why is it if somebody did that, we'd all go, well, they really think there's something spiritual. No, they know they're not spiritual and they need help in that area. Why is that not something that happens more often? I am not. Please continue to bring your physical prayer requests. But you know that for every physical problem in this room, there's probably ten spiritual problems. And that ought to be the priority in our life and the priority in our prayer. We're very comfortable. Look, if I found out I had some terrible disease tomorrow, I'd be very comfortable coming to church and saying, hey, I've got this terrible disease. Would you please pray for me and pray that I get better? I wouldn't think twice about that. I'd want you to be helping me pray for those things. Why don't we do the same thing spirit? Why don't we feel comfortable spiritually? I know there's some things that are private. Okay, that's fine. But, but we, we ought to take the same liberty with our spiritual needs because they're just as legitimate, if not more so. That will be normal for God's people. It would be weird to the world. The world would think you're a weirdo, but we're not in the world. We're in the church. Let's pray for one another's needs spiritually as well as physically. Okay, number two, the highest priority. The highest priority. We've been, we've been talking general, saying that you need to have uh, spiritual prayer requests, but Paul is not general in his statement here. He doesn't just say pray for spiritual things. Out of all the spiritual things that Paul could have asked the Colossians for in verse number 3, Paul asks for one thing in particular. And that one thing in particular that he asks is that the Lord would give him an opportunity to talk to somebody about the mystery of Christ. That God would give him an open door to speak the truth and that when that open door came that he would speak in the right way, say the right thing as he ought to speak. That was his prayer request. So we said that the spiritual is more important than the physical. Okay? On the very top of the spiritual, the most important out of all the most importance, is that the lost would hear the gospel. That somebody that's lost in their sin would hear the gospel at your mouth. And that when that opportunity came to you, that you would say what you're supposed to say in the way you're supposed to say it. When's the last time we prayed for that? Maybe it's every day. Praise the Lord for you. But when's the last time you got up and said, God, give me an opportunity to witness to somebody today. And when an opportunity arises, help me not to chicken out. Help me not to say something dumb. Help me to say the right thing. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Look, spiritual things are the most, spiritual is more important than physical, right? Do you know what the most important spiritual thing is? The salvation of a sinner. You being the proper witness. Out of anything Paul could have asked for, he said, please help me to speak. Look, he's in, he's, in, he's, in, he's in a prison cell. He's in chains. He's somewhere, probably with limited access to people. Paul is sitting in this cell just hoping that a guard will walk past and give him the time of day so he could speak the gospel to somebody. Paul's hoping that when they bring his meal for the day that he'd be able to talk to that person, that, that maybe they could converse, maybe they got the same language, maybe he could tell them about Jesus Christ. He's praying that, that God will allow him to be on trial in front of somebody who will be willing to hear the gospel. Paul is just begging for an opportunity to tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Your physical life is important, but not as important as your spiritual life. And the most important aspect of your spiritual life is the gospel. I think we, I think we, lose, I think we lose sight of that far too often. There, there are a lot of aspects to the Christian life, and there are a lot of aspects to the local church, are there not? Christian life, you've got, you've got your family, you've got your church life, you've got your work, you've got your Bible reading, you've got your study, you've got your prayer. You've got your thoughts and your emotions. In a local church, you've got services, you've got Sunday schools, you've got music, singing, you've got choir, you've got fellowships, you've got activities, you have missions conferences, you have Bible conferences, you have all sorts of different meetings and activities going on. It's easy to lose sight. All those things are important. All those things are necessary. All those things are biblical. Right. There's something that you're supposed to do as an individual. There's something you're supposed to do as a local church. 
but I'm afraid far too often. A Christian gets saved, and it seems like oftentimes all they want to do is tell other people about Jesus Christ. They just want to get out there and witness to whoever will listen. And then they get in church. And that's a good thing. And they start adding in all these other aspects to the Christian life, and that's all good, but what happens far too often is they stop focusing on what ought to be the main focus because they're so divided amongst these other things. Activities are great. Missions conferences and Bible conferences are great. Family, Bible, that's all so biblical. But the most important thing, and seems like one of the first things we forget, is telling lost people that Jesus Christ died for their sins, and they can be saved from hell if they believe on Him. What a message this morning. Man, about, about, could you imagine getting dumped into a lake of fire for all eternity? Can you imagine standing watching someone else being dumped into the lake of fire that you could have witnessed to? And that great white throne judgment, it's the most important, it's the absolute most important thing. Uh, look, 70, 80 years on this life versus eternity. Which one matters more? Absolutely eternity. So the highest priority of a Christian ought to be preaching the gospel. This isn't the only time a Christian prayed or asked for prayer concerning this topic. There's a, quite a few more times. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter number 4. Look at the early apostles. They'd just gone out. They preached the gospel. They got persecuted swiftly. So they came back to their own. <clears throat> and they're praying together. They're gathered together praying to the Lord. Look at verse 29. Acts chapter 4 and 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Word. The prayer of the early church is that God would allow them, in the midst of the threatenings, in the midst of the persecution, that God would give them the boldness they needed to preach the gospel. They didn't ask for the threatenings to get taken away necessarily. They said, Lord, if this is how it's going to be, if we're going to get beaten every time we go out and preach Jesus, if we're going to get thrown in jail every time we go out and preach Jesus, if we're going to be put in chains every time we preach Jesus, give us the boldness we need to continue doing it anyway. That was the prayer request of the early church. Not physical, spiritual, and not just any spiritual. The main thing is that they tell other people about Jesus. We lose sight of that as Christians. I'm afraid that sometimes we lose sight of that as a church. Really, the main purpose of the church existing is not what's going on in here. It's what the people in here take out there. Your main function is to preach the gospel to the lost. Look at Romans chapter 10. Here's Paul, Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Romans chapter number 10. A lot of people think the church just exists to serve them. A lot of people think the church just exists to have activities and fellowships for them and their children. That's not why the church exists. Those are great and wonderful things, and we'll continue doing that until the Lord comes back. But the reason the church exists is to bring the gospel to the lost. And if the church isn't doing that, it's not doing its purpose for existing. And that's why you have so many dead church. You see a church, man, it's, it's dying out. It's dying out. I'm not trying to be... And you go, you go, and, and, and they're... No, Great people, kind people with a King James Bible preaching the gospel, preaching the... And you say, why is this work so... Why is this dying out? Everything's right. It's because they're 100% internal with no outreach, no witnessing, no reaching the law. Track, sit in a track rack for 20 years. Nobody goes out with a sign on a street corner. Nobody witnesses when they go to Walmart, when they go to their job, when they go to their school. That is a, that is a recipe for a dead church. And let me tell you, you get great preaching here, and there's some of the best Christians in the world right here in this building right now. Listen to these services, perhaps out there. At home, go listen to these services later. Best Christians in the world. And this church will, will go down that path if we quit preaching the gospel. Doesn't matter how good your preaching is. Doesn't matter how good the people are. If you quit preaching the gospel, this church will be dead as a doornail. In Ten years. Less than that. Really, a church dies when they stop. It just takes a while to see the, the effects and the results of that thing. Right, right. In Romans 10, verse number 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. This is Paul speaking, and he said, My prayer, my desire for these people is that they'll trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, very similar to our verse in Colossians. 
lots of times in the Bible where people pray that the Lord would help them to witness, that the Lord would save other people, or ask for prayer in the area of witnessing or speaking. Ephesians 6, verse number 19. And for me, the utterance, uh, look at verse 18 so we get the context. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So again, Paul says, I'm, I'm in bonds. I'm in prison, and I'm just praying that you would pray, that you, I'm asking you to pray for me that I would have an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ, even though I'm in this situation. You can write down if you're interested, I got a little ahead of myself, but Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is where we get that the church exists to preach the gospel. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Ghost, and when I do, you will be my witnesses. That's why you were given the Holy Spirit. That's why you were put into the body of Christ. That's why this body exists. Yes to edify believers. Yes to teach believers. Yes to exhort believers. That's all part of it. That's good. But why am I up here edifying you? Why am I up here trying to teach you? So you can just have a head full of knowledge and, and go home so you can die one day or get raptured one day and go to heaven and say, look what I know, Lord. I don't think he's going to be very impressed. We're not training you for a heavenly Sunday school class, okay? The point of you getting the knowledge that you get when you come here is so that you can go tell other people on this earth. So that you can be a better witness. So that you can be a bolder witness. Or so you can teach some other saved person so they could go witness. That's the purpose of all this. This isn't just a formality. This isn't just so you go, go home and say, wow, I really learned something. And then what? You know, it's, isn't it annoying? Wait, wait, wait. Think back to some of the stuff you learned in school. And I'm not suggesting the school's unimportant. But if you think back to some of that stuff, right. it was just really, some of it was a waste of time. Can we admit that? Some of it was a waste of time. All the kids are going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of it you've never used since you got out of high school right. or college, okay? That, that would be a waste. The Bible's not like that. Amen. This is meant to be used in your Christian life. This is meant to be used in your spiritual life. There have been many people, individuals, and many churches who have lost sight of this fact and it's killed them spiritually. Let's not put our church or ourselves on that list. The gospel needs to be your main priority as a Christian. If you're not doing something consistently, regularly, to the best of your ability, as much as you possibly can to reach the lost, you need to start. You gotta get, look, you gotta get out on the street corner. No, I know it's, I know it's nervous, I know it's nerve-wracking, I know we don't want to do it, and there's people who do it, so we'll let other people... If there's any way at all you can be there, you, you really should be there. That is an opportunity to, to, at the very least, hold a sign and tell other people about Jesus. And there's many other opportunities throughout your day, if you can't make it to that, where you should be witnessing to other people. God help us. All right, number three. The modesty. Let's consider the modesty and humility of Paul's request. There are two things in this request that show us the humility and the modesty of Paul. First off is who he was asking and then is what he was asking, but who he was asking for prayer. Paul wasn't just asking his preacher friends to pray for him. Paul didn't write to the church at Colossae and say, hey, all you really spiritual church leaders, will you pray for me? No, Paul was writing this letter to every single member of that church, be they great or small, the baby Christian, the mature Christian, the pastor and the newest member. Paul wanted every single one of them to pray for him. He wasn't just using a prayer request to get in, you know, hey, uh, pastor so-and-so, pray for me because and it's really just you want to talk to a pastor that you really look up to. You want him to know that you're really spirit. Hey, I'm going to go witness to somebody tomorrow. Pray for me, pastor, pastor so-and-so, but preacher so-and-so. No, Paul asked everyone to pray for him, and it shows us his humility. He was just sincerely wanting prayer in this area. Many times, and it's sad, only the pastor reads the missionary's prayer letters. You have a man in the pulpit who knows the prayer request of the missionary. But Paul said, I don't want just the pastor to know my prayer request. I want everybody to know my prayer request. I want everybody to be praying for me. So we all ought to be praying for our missionaries. Not, not only the pastor, not, he should be the only one with knowledge of the request. But then what he was asking. 
We already made it clear the fact that he was asking for a spiritual need, but let's go back to Colossians. If you're not there, you might have turned back there. It's just a couple pages over from Ephesians. That's where I am. Let's go back to Colossians 4. Consider again what he's asking for particularly. This is Paul the Apostle. The, the great Paul the Apostle who went and, I mean, boldly witnessed to so many people. And look at what he's asking for. Verse 3, With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Paul is saying, if I get that opportunity to witness, I am not positive that I'm going to say the right thing. I am not positive that I'm going to speak as I ought to speak. Right there in Ephesians, he just said, pray for me that I would speak boldly. Paul is telling these people, listen, I don't know if I'm going to be a good witness in this situation. Will you pray for me? Paul is saying, I'm lacking some boldness here. Would you help me pray that I would be bold in my witness? Let's say, let's say on Wednesday, we have our, our, our prayer night. Let's say a, a newborn baby Christian that just started coming to church stood up and said, pray for me, everyone. You know, I, I'm really timid and I'm really shy and, 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 and I have a hard time witnessing. Would you please pray for me? That I'd be more bold. We'd say, oh, praise the Lord. That's good. I'm, I'm glad that he wants to, to do better in that area. Let's say somebody who's, who's been in church for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. We consider a mature Christian. What if they got up in church and said, we all pray for me. I'm, I'm a terrible witness. I'm scared to death of it. I need some boldness. I need some help in this area. Would you please pray for me? You'd say, praise the Lord. But you might be tempted to think, they've been saved for a long time. They teach a Sunday school class. I mean, they... They should be able to witness. They shouldn't have a problem with boldness. That's, I mean, what if the pastor got up yeah. and said, I'm a terrible witness. I am, I am, I, that's not saying that's your pastor. But just say your pastor were to get up and say, I need some real help. I'm not very bold. I don't speak as I ought to speak. If I got an opportunity to witness, I'm scared that I wouldn't take it. And if I did take it, I'd say the wrong thing. You'd say, well, I thought the pastor was a, knew everything about the Bible. I thought that he'd be able to witness in any situation with all boldness. That's a little weird. What if Paul the Apostle got up and said, I need your help. I don't know if I'm going to say the right... Not say the right thing. Paul, he wrote half the New Testament. What do you mean not say the right thing? And Paul said, I'm not positive that I'll say the right thing. Would you help me? What if Paul did that? He did. He did. Right here in the book of Colossians. That entire church laid himself out there and said... I'm not that great at this. Would you pray for me so that God would get the glory, so that somebody would get saved? If Paul could do that, what's stopping us? I'm sure there's many people that could stand up and make that same prayer request. Sure. I'll make it right now. I need help in my witnessing life. I'm ashamed of that. I'm not bold like I ought to be. I don't speak up like I ought to speak. I get scared to death to open my mouth because I'm scared I'm going to say something dumb. And I sell out our Savior because I don't want to look silly. I'm sure there's a lot of people here that raise their hand and say that's their prayer request for their life as well. And if it's not that, it's something else. If Paul the Apostle, with everything at stake, a great reputation, well, I'm scared. If I made a prayer request like that, everybody would think I'm not as spiritual as they think I am now. And maybe they wouldn't give me the responsibilities or they wouldn't come to me for advice or for help or they wouldn't look up to me as a great witness or they wouldn't ask me to, to do things and... Look, if you don't ask for help, it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that you need help. Right. It just keeps you from getting the help you need. Good. If Paul the Apostle could stand up in front of this church in, in letter form, and not just this church, all churches forever, whoever reads the Bible, yeah. if Paul could do that, what's, what's, why are we so proud that we can't ask for a little help in spiritual areas? I think it would greatly, greatly benefit us. I know, I know you because I know me and what keeps us from standing up and making those spiritual requests are our pride sure. we've heard it preach I'm not the first one to tell you why don't we make more spiritual requests and not so many physical requests I know why because of our pride right. we're afraid what people will think of us we're afraid to admit we've got a spiritual problem yeah. let's just get rid of all that yeah. don't you want to be a better church don't you want to be a better person don't you want to be more spiritual don't you want to be more effective in our job of witnessing? It ain't, it ain't worth it. It ain't worth dying, falling short of your goals because you're too proud to ask for some help of God's people. 
and they all got requests, just like you do. might be different than yours, but we all got things we need help with. The Bible says to confess your faults one to another. Now, please, don't get up and confess your deepest, darkest sins. The Bible says your faults. There's some things we don't want to know. They're under the blood. Just keep them that way. <laughs> but your faults, the Bible says we ought to confess those faults one to another so that we might pray for each other. All right, that's number three. We take a couple more. Let's do a couple more. Number four. <clears throat> these will go quick, I think. The urgency of the Christian's witness. The urgency of the Christian's witness. Paul was in a situation here where he was limited in his ability to preach the gospel. And he asked the Colossians church to pray that despite his current situation, he would have the opportunity to preach to others. Okay, now consider this. Although Paul was currently bound and unable to go out freely and preach, there was a time in his life where he was able to go out and freely preach. Let's take advantage of the opportunities we have now because we might not have them in the future. Now, in Paul's case, he did take advantage of those opportunities. He was a bold witness while he was free and a bold witness while he was bound. But I'm afraid if it's not all this junk, oh, this is the end of America, America's never going to be this, ah, you, you don't know that. But if it's not this trouble that we're facing, eventually there will be a trouble that will limit your ability to speak the gospel. Maybe not our generation, maybe a future generation, but eventually there's going to be a time where we no longer have the freedom to speak that we have right now. And if that time is during our lifetime, I guarantee every one of us will look back on the time we were free to speak and look back at the opportunities we had to witness. And we regret that we didn't take full advantage of those opportunities because we no longer have them. Paul's sitting in a jail cell saying, man, I just want an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Now, thankfully for his conscience, he took lots of opportunities in the past. But if tomorrow you were in a jail cell, what would your thoughts be? Man, I wish I would have taken more opportunity to witness when I was free. You might not always have the opportunities you have now, whether it's by imprisonment, our freedoms taken away, or death itself. You'd be standing before the Lord tomorrow. And as wonderful as that would be, there's no, there's, there's no more opportunity to witness when you get there. Let's take the full advantage of the opportunities that we have here and now. Number five. Number five. Let's talk about <clears throat> the result of Paul's prayer. We can read in the Bible what resulted of Paul's prayer. Come to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter number 1. Paul's prayer request was that the gospel would be preached, not necessarily that he would get out of prison himself. I'm, I'm quite positive that Paul would have loved to get out of prison, but he stated quite clearly that his main concern was that the gospel would be preached. Now, it's hard to say this, this verse in Philippians, if it was written before or after Colossians or around the same time of Colossians, all seems to happen very close together. Uh, but for sake of argument, we'll, we'll, we'll say it happened after. I mean, it didn't even need to. It still, still applies to the point we're going to we're going to make here. <clears throat> let's, let's read verse number 12. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some of, also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and, therein, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul is sitting in a jail cell rejoicing. You say, why is he so happy? Did he get out? No, he didn't get out, but because of his bonds, the gospel is being preached all over the place. And Paul's sitting in prison saying, praise the Lord, I'm glad the gospel's getting out. Praise the Lord, I'm glad that people are getting saved. Praise the Lord. Oh, what's, what's the deal, you, Paul? Did you just hear that you're going to get released? No, I don't think I'm ever getting out of here, but I heard that the gospel's still going out around the world. I heard those churches that I helped start are still started and still going strong and preaching to other people. I even heard that some people are more bold to speak the gospel because I'm in prison. Right. What a blessing. You know what Paul said? 
I don't care if I get out of here. I just want the gospel to be preached. And the Lord said, okay, the gospel is being preached, but you're still not getting out. And Paul said, praise the Lord. Because he was sincere when he said that his desire was the gospel to be preached. He wasn't just saying that to sound spiritual. He truly desired first and foremost that the gospel would get out around the world. Come to Acts chapter 28. Read this verse and then make one more point <clears throat> after that. Acts chapter number 28. Paul never got out. He was never released. He was never a free man. But the Lord granted his prayer request that he would have a door of utterance. Look at Acts 28. In verse number 16. Uh, verse number 16. When we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. Uh, sorry, lost my place there, looking back at my notes. Uh, and it, it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. I'm sorry, let's start back at verse 16. I apologize. And when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. You know what Paul ended up? House arrest. He, he was allowed to dwell by himself, a whole lot better than a prison cell, but he's still under arrest. He, he's still in a house. He's still unable uh, to go out freely. There was a, a guard that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our father, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had aught to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear thee of what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. Look at verse number 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. He didn't get out. He's still under arrest, but you know what? A door was open. Now, that door only opened one way. It opened to let people in so he could preach to him. It didn't open the other way so he could get out. But Paul received his prayer request that he might speak to other people about the gospel. The application I want to make from that is, look, don't be disappointed when God answers your prayer like the Bible says to pray about your situation. You say, Lord, I don't care if I ever get better. I just want to, the rest of my life, I want to be a witness to you. Then rejoice when you don't get better, but you get to be a witness for him. Oh, Lord, I, 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 you know, all I want to do, I'll eat rice and beans. I'll drive an old car. I just want to give more to missions. Don't be disappointed when God doesn't make you rich and you're eating rice and beans and driving a beat-up car. But you got to give to missions. That's what's important. What we're trying to say is don't be disappointed when God grants your spiritual request and it doesn't work out to your physical benefit. Because it probably won't. But if you're like Paul and you're sincere, you're sincere in your requests, you'll have rejoicing on the other side. You'll still be happy, even locked up in prison, even eating rice and beans, even sick. Because God will, will grant your request, if it's in the name of Jesus Christ, according to His will, your spiritual requests. And if you are sincere in your asking, that will not be a disappointment to you like it was not a disappointment to Paul. Okay, number six. This will be the last one. We'll go as quick as we can. <clears throat> Come back to Colossians chapter number four. Colossians chapter number four. Look at verse 3 again. With all praying also for us. 
with all, that means with all the other things as well as. So Paul told them in verse number two, make sure that you continue in prayer. And then verse number three, he gets specific. He says, everything you're praying about, don't forget to pray for us. And so number six, what we want to talk about is be sure to pray for your ministers. Be they, be they your pastor or your missionaries, pray for those that are working for you and with you to get the gospel out around the world. <clears throat> we as Christians need to be praying for one another. There's no doubt. I need to pray for, for everybody. You need to pray for everybody, all Christians. But in particular, we need to pray for our pastors and our missionaries. Now, we need to be careful here. We, we certainly do not want to exalt men in any way. We're not trying to put men, certain men, way. oh, he's a pastor. You, you, you need to pray for him. He's a pastor. We're not, we're not trying to resolve, and we certainly don't want to make it sound like it's the job of some Christians to do the work of the ministry and other Christians just to pray for them. It's every Christian's job to witness, okay? No, oh, you know, the pastor's the one that does the, the spiritual work, and I just sit here and pray for him. No, 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 no. You've got lots of spiritual work to do yourself, but the Bible teaches that your missionaries and your pastor should be of particular interest in your prayer time. You need to spend some extra time asking God to help the man that he has put above you in the faith. You need to spend some extra time asking God to bless the missionaries that are sent out of your church and all the missionaries that you know. If you aren't careful, you will allow your imagination, you will allow your past experiences, negative past experiences, or you will allow that stupid TV and internet to convince you that all a pastor does all day is, you know, like Reverend Alden on Little House, and he just sits around, you know, and eats all day, and then on Sunday he gets up and preaches a sermon. That's not how it goes. That man works very, very hard. You don't get a message like you got this morning from just waking up Sunday morning and saying, no, let's see what the Lord lays on my heart. I guarantee you he studied all week for that and every other of the many messages he preached. And it's not just preaching. There's a lot more work that goes into that thing. There's a lot of stress and a lot of Paul says the care of all the churches. That's legitimate. There's a lot of care and a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of a man who's leading a church. And you ought to pray for that man. You ought to pray that the Lord, he doesn't do, that somebody, oh yeah, I wish I, I wish I only worked two days a week. Oh, I wish I worked three hours a week. That is not at all how it goes. That man works just as hard, if not harder, than anyone else here. Absolutely. A lot of Christians think that there's just normal Christians, and then there's a man that God hits over the head with a sermon Saturday night, and that's who the pastor is. That's not how it works. Not at all. Your pastor works hard, and you ought to pray for him. You ought to labor for him in prayer. He could sure use them, I'm sure. Now we, look, we aren't Calvinists. You know what a, Cal a Calvinist is? Some of their main doctrine is that everything was predetermined before the foundation of the world. Anything that happens, you can't help it because God preordained before the foundation of the world that I would drop this pen at that exact second. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's going to happen. We aren't Calvinists. We don't believe that way. That's not what the Bible teaches. But sometimes we act like that in our prayer life. You know next Sunday's not predetermined? What he preaches and how he preaches can be influenced by your prayers. How he studies this week can be changed by how you pray for him. The results of his preaching can be influenced by what you pray. A good service and a dead service could be influenced by whether or not you pray for the man who's going to be preaching the sermon. He's studying all week to bring you a message. You can be praying for him that whole time. The results of our public outreach are not predetermined. Right. Somebody might get saved Saturday, and somebody might not. And the difference might be whether or not you pray for them. Good. Somebody might end up in hell on Sunday, or they might be gloriously saved for all eternity. Right. And the difference might be whether or not you spend time praying for them and for your pastor and for your missionaries. Those, the result of these missionary endeavors are not predetermined. It's not whatever will be, will be. You might have a missionary that's going to come off the field next year due to some horrible trouble that could have been avoided if you would have taken the time to pray for him. That's very, very real. Your prayers matter, and they can influence what happens tomorrow and next week and this church 100 years down the road if we're still here before the Lord comes back. 
Pray for your pastor. Pray for your missionaries. I'd like to read this. I don't know who this guy is. I probably wouldn't suggest reading after him. It, it appears from this quote that he's got some sort of Catholic or, or some sort of church like that, some sort of uh, influence from, from that kind of thing. But this is a good quote that I found in a commentary, and I'd like to read it. I Think about it as we read it. There is much criticism bestowed upon preachers, much of canvassing of their doctrines, much readiness in imagining that they are swerving from what is orthodox and sound, much complaining that they are not simple enough or too simple, not profound enough or not practical enough or not interesting enough or not searching enough. But is there much of prayer that God would guide them into the knowledge of truth and put into their mouths the message most appropriate to the several classes of hearers? Indeed, we say not this is in order to exculpate the minister as though he were not himself answerable for erroneous or defective ministrations, but probably in most cases the blame is at least to be divided, and as a general rule the parish or district which has derived least good from its pastor is the parish or district which has offered the least prayer for its pastor. Whilst a congregation is murmuring that, it, that its teacher never seems to be beyond the first elements of truth, there is perhaps scarcely, uh, is scarcely one of its members who make it a, a point of conscious frequently to ask God to open the, to that teacher the treasures of wisdom and knowledge whilst the pews are occupied with fears and suspicions that something unsound or even heretical has found its way into the pulpit, there is hardly one of the hearers who offers his daily supplication that God would keep the instructor from being carried about by the winds of false doctrine. What marvel, then, if there is but little progress in spiritual things, and the public ministrations of the word seem instrumental to the converting and confirming, but few. The hands even of Moses fell, were not sustained by Aaron and Ur, and even Paul lent on, lent on converts at Colossae, when hoping to be honored in making converts at Rome. Another thing saying, a lot of people criticize the men of God, whether they're missionaries, whether they're, I, I, I don't like that term, you know, you know what I mean when I say that, but be they missionaries, be they, be they pastors, be wherever they are. But usually the people they're getting the least out of those endeavors are the people who pray for them the least. And so let's be sure to pray for our ministers. Pray for your pastor, pray for your missionaries, and if you want to include the assistant pastor in that as well, I sure wouldn't argue with you. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity.